Hi, I'm Skip Nipper. Welcome to my podcast where I tell you about Nashville's great baseball history and traditions. Shot to write a one hop liner. Certainly about its past, especially about Tom Wilson Park, Herschel Greer Stadium, Sulphur Dell, but also a little bit about its present and future, too. Yes, he can. It makes the waist high catch. And I introduce you to players, coaches, and other fans and their love for everything baseball. A high fly ball down the right field corner going way back. Hits a lead on home run. Now, here in Music City, the name goes with the territory. In 1925, the establishment of radio station WSM and its launch of the broadcast that would be called the Grand Ole Opry further secured Nashville's reputation as a musical center and sparked its nickname of Music City. And if you go downtown today, every music genre can be heard, not just country or country and Western music. You name it, it's being strummed, tooted, and sung in Music City. The spread of the name includes a bowl game, Music City Bowl, and the Nashville Sounds minor league team have worn jerseys with Music City on the front. They've even taken it to another level by adding Hit City to one of the many names to market with success, and it fits so well. Because we are Hit City based on the hits at the ballpark, but the hits that have been produced up and down Music Row, excuse me, Music Square, and marketed out of recording studios and public relations firms. So ballparks, football and soccer stadiums, and just about every other sports venue has added concerts to add to the attraction of entertainment. Why, even old Sulphur Dell was used as a music venue. Did you know that? Are you serious, Clark, even with the quirky outfields in the background? Well, you bet. Now, I do not remember attending a concert at Sulphurdale, although beyond a few Nashville Vols games our grandfather and dad took us to, I do remember seeing the Shrine Circus. But let me take you back to 1960, because I've had some friends that have said that they were at this concert held at Sulphurdale. Now, this was the year of my 10th birthday. I probably wasn't able to go down to, to Sulphurdale to watch a concert although I think they quit uh, having concerts there in 1963, the last year of the Nashville Vols. And I remember some of the songs that had become popular in the pre-Beatles era for my brother and me and my classmates and friends. Now, here's the top 10 songs, just for reference, of 1960. Some of them you'll remember, uh, although not all, either the song nor the artist. Number one on the year was Theme from a Summer Place by Percy Faith, and that was an orchestra. And number two, He'll Have to Go by Jim Reeves, who was a country music star. Number three, the Everly Brothers had a great hit, Kathy's Clown. Number four, Running Bear. Does that one ring a bell by Johnny Preston? I remember the name, kind of remember the song. A favorite was number five, Teen Angel by Mark Denning, although I would never have told you his name. We're referring to the title of the song. Number six, I'm Sorry by everybody's favorite, Brenda Lee. Number seven was It's Now or Never. Certainly, I remember that one by Elvis Presley. Number eight was Handyman, Jimmy Jones. Number nine, Stuck on You, again by Elvis Presley. And then, man, it was a big hit at number 10, The Twist by Chubby Checker. Everybody did The Twist. If you didn't know how to dance, You could go over to somebody's house on a Friday or Saturday night with your classmates, play records, and do the twist. Now, the reason I chose 1960 is because there was a well-publicized concert at the Old Dell on Tuesday, May the 3rd. And I mean, it was well-publicized in the newspapers, in the sports pages, in the entertainment sections. It included a star-studded lineup. No, it was not a baseball game, but it was held at a ballpark. And although I do not recognize some of these stars, I do recognize many of them. Here's the starting lineup for that concert. Lloyd Price and his orchestra, the Coasters, I remember that name, Bo Diddley, of course, Laverne Baker, Little Anthony and the Imperials, boy, they were great, Sammy Turner, Jimmy Jones, Joe Turner, Jimmy Reed, and Harold Comer. Now, usually entertainment reporters would attend concerts and report in the newspaper a day or two later. But in this case, a writer named Pat Anderson 
wrote about his experience attending the concert, and he published it a few days later in the May 8th Sunday edition of the Nashville Tennessean in the Better Living section, which was also an entertainment section. Anderson was a music reporter, but he also covered other events. And here's how Anderson described the show. In an article entitled, Rock and Roll is Safe Stuff Now, Too Many Cops Spoil the Brawls, Can't Even Dance in Aisles. And he goes on to say, determined to leave no stone unturned on the local music scene, I attended a rock and roll show last week. It was billed as the biggest show of stars of 1960. And in rock and roll circles, it certainly was that. And he lists the stars that I just listed earlier. And he says it was held at Sulphurdale. The weather was fine and a good crowd turned out, perhaps 5,000 mostly teenagers, about 60% white to 40% Negro. The whites sat along the third baseline and the Negroes along the first baseline. The crowd was varied. The boys, who outnumbered the girls two to one, ranged from clean cut to not so clean cut. Ducktails were in fashion and more than a few pockets sagged with half pints. Mingled in were a scattering of undergraduates and a handful of Runyon-esque adults And there was also a good number of city policemen. And from the beginning, he says, there was a feeling of anticipation in the air. Something was going to happen on stage or off. And as far as I could see, it never did. Anyway, here's how it went. The first act, Little Anthony and the Imperials, ended their stint with Little Anthony moaning something like, oh, baby, for 10 minutes. And things became mildly exciting. So far, so good. Next came Sammy Turner, who made the mistake of singing ballads. The crowd wanted ballads like it wanted Grandma Moses. He was followed by Bernard Byers, who was more gymnastic, but no sensation. And the crowd was getting restless, and the next singer, Jimmy Reed, got a rousing welcome. By then, every act was getting a rousing welcome, only to see the enthusiasm dwindle as they performed. And during Reed's act, one heavy set white youth got up and bopped in the aisle for a few seconds. And five minutes later, he got up and wiggled again until two policemen told him to sit down. 3,000 people stood up to watch. It was that way the rest of the night. Someone would stand up and shimmy, heads would start turning, people would stand up, and finally, when nothing developed, they would turn their attention back to whoever was on stage. The MC became increasingly unconvincing as he warned that the show would be stopped if anyone danced in the audience. Reed was followed by Jimmy Jones, who distinguished himself by turning a somersault while he sang. And next came Joe Turner, one of the best blues singers around. Turner hadn't been on two minutes when a stout Negro woman stood up and began vibrating, stealing the show for a couple of minutes. Turner was followed by Bo Diddley, Easy the Night's champion gyrator who spiced his guitar playing by carrying on a comedy routine with another musician. Here are a few samples. Man, that was no lady. That was my wife. Or, man, I hear you got a new job standing outside a doctor's office making people sick. But Dudley had the crowd going up and down like yo-yos. At 9.50, his I'm Gonna Roll moved a young Negro girl to dance a few steps which moved three or 4,000 people to stand and watch. At 9.55, the heavy-set white youth was up and at it again until police let him out. He departed with the dignity befitting a martyr, but Diddley stole the scene by leaving the stage and dancing dangerously toward the grandstand, a real pro that Bo Diddley. And next came the Coasters, who sang a couple of pretty good songs, Searchin' and Poison Ivy but they were tame after Bo Diddley and the crowd was getting restless again. A 10-year-old boy with three tattoos on his right arm who had been sitting next to me took his seven up and wandered away. Next, Laverne Baker, a pretty good singer, got a wild ovation when she and the MC broke into a dance routine that may have been hot stuff for Sulphur Dell, but would have had any red-blooded conventioneer demanding his money back. Clyde McFadder and Lloyd Price were the last two acts, and they were well-received. Price, an obvious favorite with the fans along the first baseline, got the night's biggest ovation. And that was it. Whatever should have happened didn't, it seemed. I was disappointed, but ready to blame any disappointment on old age until a young rock and roll fan told me she felt the same way. 
It wasn't anything like last year, she said. It was just frustrating to have to sit there with all those policemen around and not be able to dance. But let's give the last word to one of those mean old policemen. Pretty dull show, he said with a yawn. Only had to send for one paddy wagon. Things were different back in 1960. The city was on the verge of integration with the school system, with busing and things like that. It undoubtedly was a sedate crowd. I don't know what Anderson was expecting, but it sounds like everybody was having a good time, although there's always some critique about the entertainment on the stage and whatnot. But that wasn't the last concert at Sulphurdale. Now, today we have new places for concerts. Even the Ryman Auditorium is open to every type of music there is. And long before our city grew, as it has been growing over the last 10 years or so, music was here in our ballpark. It's in the Nashville Sounds ballpark at First Horizon Park now. And it's at Jodis Park, and it's at Nissan Stadium, and certainly at the arena downtown. But when Major League Baseball comes to town, I'm sure the echoes of concerts held long ago will be in tune with new music of Nashville's stars.